Well, hello again, everyone. This is Mitchell Moak, an extension agent with the University of Tennessee and Tennessee State University Extension Program in Rutherford County. And I'm going to talk to you for the next few minutes uh, this afternoon about this topic that I've chosen to call the worms of spring and summer. And what I'm talking about here are some of the common, or actually four, of the very common caterpillar or, or worm pests that do uh, show up in landscapes around Middle Tennessee and Rutherford County each year and, and kind of how to recognize those pests, identify what they are, and then maybe some steps to take to help control those or minimize those populations and potential damage that they can cause to your landscapes. The first one we'll mention this morning or this afternoon is the Eastern Tent Caterpillar. And you can see uh, a nest or a tent of those caterpillars pictured here in this slide. Uh, we'll take another shot. Here's one. You can see kind of a, a backed off version or a backed off view uh, from that uh, particular tent. And you can see the, the, the little caterpillars, the larva inside the tent there. But you'll notice that those, uh, that they build their tents down here in these crotch angles or at the limb junctions uh, of the trees. Uh, here's another shot, a closer up of, uh, of, a, of, ma of a mature larva, if you would. That thing's probably in the neighborhood of two to two and a half inches long. You'll notice the white stripe uh, down its back, the white line down its back. You know, in body, uh, their body color is mostly a dark, uh, uh, some shade of dark color. Uh, they are hairy, uh, sparsely hairy up and down the length of their body. You'll also notice these blue markings down the sides of the caterpillar. So those, just the fact of uh, uh, where they build their nest and the cross angles of those trees and those colorations, are easy ways to identify and also the time of year that they show up. Now, very often people will mistakenly refer to these worms uh, as bagworms because of the, their white silken tent or nest or, or folks say, well, it's like a bag, so it must be a bagworm. But they're not really bagworms or tent caterpillars. Uh, they, these caterpillars, would, when given the choice, will uh, build their nests in wild cherry trees, apple trees, crab apples, but they can be found in a lot of other species also. Uh, typically, the egg hatch on these uh, little guys is in early March each year, and as soon as, uh, as soon as those eggs hatch, those young larvae begin feeding and building those tents that they're going to live in in those limb crotches or limb junctions uh, up and down the up and down the tree. Now, the larvae do leave the tent to go feed. They don't feed inside the tent, but they go out and feed on foliage within the tree. Uh, they may leave there multiple times during the day to do that, but they always return back to the tent. Typically, that feeding period uh, or the larval stage is anywhere from four to six weeks long. Once those larvae mature, and once again, when they mature, they'll be about two, two and a half inches long, they will, they will migrate to another area away from the tent to pupate. Very often, they will leave the tree entirely, uh, and they may, they may migrate in mass when there's lots and lots of them in a particular spring. Those populations do cycle. They go up and they go down. But in years when there's lots of them, folks may be a bit alarmed to see these caterpillars crawling out across sidewalks and, and driveways and across streets and out on the ground. And they can be real messy uh, when, when automobiles drive over them or when people step on them as they're walking along. But they're going to move to another area to pupate. To build, they'll create a little cocoon. They'll pupate. And typically by mid to the latter part of April, the larva uh, stage of that insect is gone for us. So we're not really seeing too many of those right now. Those occurred back earlier this year. And we did get some calls at the extension office from people uh, asking about these, these bag worms that they were seeing up in their trees. Uh, after they pupate, the adults will emerge about three weeks later. Then the adult, the moths, these things are, are, are the larva of moths. They'll come out, they'll mate, and then the females will lay eggs that will hatch next year to start the cycle all over again, and then that female will go die. A thing to keep in mind about these is there can be lots of them in a large tree, but the damage is usually just aesthetic. It's not really going to cause a, a significant uh, uh, damage to the tree. It's not going to compromise its health or uh, the vigor, the vitality of the tree in most instances. On smaller trees in the landscape, yes, they can defoliate those and they, they look unsightly. But as far as extreme damage, they don't really cause extreme damage. Typically in large trees, uh, we don't recommend that you try to do uh, any aggressive steps to control those. In smaller trees, you certainly can. We'll discuss that in just a minute. You know, here's an example uh, of what an adult uh, tent caterpillar moth is going to look like. Just kind of a little brown colored nondescript moth, uh, not any bright markings. You will notice uh, some lighter colored uh, oblique, uh, roughly oblique lines there on the sides of the wings. But now when these, uh, one thing interesting about these moths is when they go to lay their eggs, they'll go to another tree or to a tree and they'll lay that egg mass 
around a tree limb, uh, a pencil size in diameter or so. And there's kind of an interesting looking mass of eggs. It's easy to identify. Uh, this mass of eggs will have anywhere from 150 to 400 eggs in it, and it'll be held together with a kind of a dark, slick, shellac-like material. You can find those. You wonder what they are, and, and you feel of it. And to, to me, it kind of feels a little bit like a, you know, like a stiff styrofoam kind of material. But you can identify those very readily when you find those on uh, limbs, on branches, out in trees. When you see one of those, you know that's an egg mass from the eastern tent caterpillar. Now, what are some control options on these? Well, first, is control really necessary? Because again, the damage is just aesthetic. So if you decide that control is necessary, the first option would be to prune out those egg masses that you find before they hatch. You prune those out, destroy those. You don't worry about that particular mass of eggs coming out to bother you as larva uh, next spring. Um, you can physically pull out or prune out any nests that are within reach and destroy the larva. You can reach up into the tree with pole pruner sometimes and, and pull and prune those nests out or knock them down on the ground and then uh, destroy the larva in that respect. Uh, you can treat them with an insecticide while they're still small and before those tents get to be uh, fully well developed because the tents, the silk and material the tents are made of, can repel uh, liquids. They can repel pesticide uh, sprays, they can repel rainwater and so on. Uh, so on. A number of different insecticides can be uh, used against them. You can use something uh, as, uh, uh, as, as, as mild, I guess, or non-aggressive as one of the Bacillus thuringiensis Bt products, the particular strain Bt Kustarki. Uh, has activity against uh, tent caterpillars. Another natural product, the spinosad, uh, you'll find it in brands like Conserve and so on, that can be used. And then you get into the pyrethroid insecticides, those that have active ingredients such as bifenthrin, permethrin, cyfluthrin, malathion, carbaryl or seven, uh, and things of that sort. A lot of different insecticides will control these, but again, you need to do it while they're still small, which while that nest is the, before it's able to repel uh, the insecticide spray. The next one up is a pest of roses, and this can be a little more damaging, I guess. Uh, very often we'll get phone calls in the May time frame each year at the Extension Office, and people will talk about, I think my rose has a disease because it's got these dead spots on the leaves, and it must be a fungus or something on there. We look at them a little closer, it's these spots we see right here. Well, that's not caused from a disease. That is actually feeding damage from these little critters uh, like this right here called a rose slug. And that uh, rose slug is the larva of, of a soft fly. A sawfly is a, is, a, is a wasp or a fly kind of insect uh, that lays these eggs and uh, they, uh, uh, they hatch and they come out and they feed on the foliage. And this damage, they're just, they're just taking the, uh, the top layer off the leaf and exposing the underneath uh, or the middle part of the leaf itself. They skeletonize that leaf. You can see the veins uh, running through there, but it does look a little bit like uh, some, in some instances fungal leaf spot damage. Here's another example of a newly hatched one. Uh, this one, this, I just took this picture uh, a couple of days ago, the 27th day of April. Uh, and you can see there's a pencil point there in the, the picture to give you uh, the, some relativity of what the size of this thing is, something to compare it against. Uh, this is an adult sawfly, adult sawfly here pictured uh, in this slide. They're called sawflies because they have a, a saw-like ovipositor. And they use that ovipositor uh, to, to do what we see in this example here. They will saw a slit in the stem of the rose and they'll lay those eggs in there. And that's what these are. Uh, these are the, the eggs of a, of a rose sawfly that are going to hatch out and become those rose slugs that feed on, uh, on the foliage of the roses. And you get lots of them out there and they can cause uh, a significant amount of damage. In, but again, it's more in terms of aesthetics. They don't really, they don't really kill the plant or, or hurt it uh, uh, from, a, from a health and vigor standpoint. But they can also cause feeding damage on the rose buds and so on. You know, as far as control options are concerned, you know, if you make insecticide applications at the first side of damage, the, they're going to be much more successful. And typically, we're going to start seeing those things emerge here in this middle Tennessee area in the late April to May time frame. And that feeding can extend on up into the summer. So as soon as you notice uh, damage, uh, the, 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 the signs, the symptoms of feeding, that's when you will make, start making those insecticide applications. Point out that you also want to target the underside of the leaves as well as the top surfaces of the leaves because many times those little rose slugs will be underneath uh, on the bottom side of the leaf doing their feeding. Uh, look for insecticides that have active ingredients such as again spinosad or malathion or acephate uh, or some of the pyrethroids that contain bifenthrin, permethrin, cyfluthrin, etc. A lot of different insecticides have efficacy against the rose slugs. 
The next one we'll mention is the bagworm. Here's a shot of a, and these are the true bagworms. Okay, here's a shot of a young bagworm that I took in May of 2015, on May the 20th. So this thing hadn't been around too long. It's re relatively small, recently hatched. And these little guys, when they hatch, they start building those little bags and take them with them. They, they move that bag with them for their entire life. Here's another shot of some young immature bagworms that are feeding there, and you can see the bags taken with them. These are some adult bagworms that were taken uh, here at a subdivision in, uh, in, 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 the, in the county, in the area here. And those are, uh, this was late in the summer. Those are pretty doggone mature bagworms right there. But they're called the bagworms because of that carrot-shaped bag or coon that they create for themselves just right soon after they hatch out. They can certainly cause significant damage and, and really cause enough damage uh, to, uh, uh, to cause some plants to have to be removed to even kill the plant or just damage it to the point that it will never recover and, and get its appearance back again and have to be removed when there's lots and lots of feeding damage out there. Now, bagworms favor a lot of different evergreens. They, they like junipers, uh, cedars, arborvitae, leland cypress, to name a few, but there's 120 plus species of plants uh, that are susceptible to their feeding injury. So you can even find them in some years on broadleaf plants, on deciduous plants, deciduous trees and shrubs. But, but typically though, uh, the, the evergreens, those needle and scale leaf evergreens are their, uh, their, their target of first opportunity, I guess, preference. Eggs are gonna begin to hatch on uh, the bagworms in late April to mid-May time frame. And just as soon as they hatch, they begin to feed the little uh, bagworms begin to feed and construct that bag they're going to take with them. They're going to move that bag around uh, as, uh, uh, with them as they move around the plant to feed. I have seen a few instances where some junipers, some globe-shaped, uh, globe shaped, round-shaped junipers had so many bagworms on there, the little small ones, that when you stood off, it looked as if you could see the, the heat shimmers on there, in the, like you see in the hot summertime, you'll see the heat shimmer on the horizon. But actually, it's like the plant was moving, but it wasn't. It just those, all those little bitty bagworms crawling around on the, on the plant itself, and that was certainly enough to cause a lot of damage to it. Typically, they're going to feed up until the August time frame, and at that point, they'll, uh, they'll settle down, they'll pick out a spot, and they'll permanently attach that bag to that place, and they'll seal it off. That bag is pretty tough, and it repels liquids, it repels water, and it makes it difficult to reach inside that bag after they get very big uh, to get an insecticide on them, so controlling when they're young is real critical. Uh, once they seal the bag off, they'll pupate, uh, and then about four weeks after they stop feeding, begin that uh, process to pupate, the adult males will emerge from the bags. Uh, the females don't emerge, don't, they don't emerge. The males will, will emerge and they'll mate with the females while the female is still in the bag. She doesn't ever emerge. Uh, the female lays eggs in the bags and then she dies. And those eggs hatch next year, again, around that uh, you know, mid to late April to mid March time frame, and the cycle just continues to sell. This uh, slide shows you some uh, uh, images of, of bags of the pupated males. You can tell uh, that it's a pupated male because you can see uh, the, uh, the pupil skin uh, where the, the critter emerged down here from the bottom of the bag, blue arrows pointing. That remnant down there is the pupil skin where this thing uh, emerged uh, from the pupil stage as an adult. Uh, in this slide, you can see uh, an example. This is the adult male moth on top of the bag, probably just newly emerged there, and then you can see uh, the, the cast pupil skin then on the end of it. The bagworms are pretty easy to identify. Uh, you know, once you see them, uh, you, you know what they look like. How to control those? Well, you can hand remove uh, the bags, with those that are within reach on small plants, uh, and, and destroy them. That's fairly easy to do. Uh, you can also treat them while they're real small with a number of different insecticides. Uh, again, you need to do it while they're small because large bags will repel water so you can't get the insecticide into them. But again, look for active ingredients uh, such as spinosad, malathion, acephate, or those pyrethroids such as bifenthrin, cyphalus, and permethrin. Those are all choices that will control bagworms fairly readily. The last one we'll talk about today is the fall webworm. It's another one of those tent building caterpillars that uh, attacks lots of different uh, trees uh, out in the landscape and out in the forest as well. Uh, you can see a shot of fall webworm here. There are two races of fall webworms that uh, we, we are likely to encounter here in Tennessee. There's a black headed uh, type that you see pictured here. Uh, they're light colored with the little dark spots down either side of their uh, of their back, and then also they have a dark head or a black head. And then there's the red-headed type, which is, again, compared to a, a pink caterpillar, it's a fairly light color, but uh, it's a little darker maybe than the black-headed uh, uh, 
type was, but they do have a very noticeable red head. They're both, uh, both types are fuzzy or, or, or hairy uh, little caterpillars. Um, these are also mistakenly referred to as bagworms by some people because of their, their silken white web bags or the nest that they live in. Now, they're typically their bags are dirtier or their nests are dirtier white uh, than the eastern tent caterpillars. Uh, there's going to be about three generations of those in Tennessee. Uh, the first adults will typically emerge from cocoons down in the soil and leaf litter and begin to lay eggs in mid March time frame. Uh, these uh, fall webworms favor roughly 88 different tree species in the United States, including pecan and hickory and black walnut, persimmon and sweet gum, just to name a few. So you have to find them on lots of different kinds of trees. Once those larvae hatch, they begin feeding and building those silken tents. But now they differ from the eastern tent caterpillar because they build their nests or their tents out on the ends of branches, whereas the tent caterpillars build their nests back at the crotch angles uh, where we had limb junctions coming together. And the, uh, uh, the webworms, they build their web, their nest, around the folds that they're feeding on. They don't leave the nest to go feed like a tent caterpillar does. They build their nest and they live and they feed and they eat and everything inside the nest. So they're going to build that nest around the folds that they're feeding on, and those nests can expand as they grow uh, and, and as they need to take in more, uh, more area to feed. And they can feed for up to eight weeks or so. Uh, and uh, often you're going to you'll see them much more noticeable later in the summertime. And they can have activity on up in uh, to the September time frame. But like the tent caterpillar, their damage is mostly aesthetic. It doesn't really cause any severe damage other than some defoliation to large trees. Again, if you have it on small trees in a landscape, that might be a bigger concern. And yeah, you might take steps to control them. But typically, control is not needed on those large trees out in the landscape or out in the wooded area, the forest areas. Uh, here's an example of a fall webworm adult moth. It's going to be a white colored kind of nondescript moth and they lay their egg mass on, uh, on leaves. Uh, you can see this layer of eggs laid on the underside of this leaf and then here's another shot of the of adult fall webworm moth uh, where she's laid those eggs on the underside of the leaf as well. You know control options, uh, again I ask the question is control really necessary? Uh, you got to decide if it's on a great big tree, is it really worth it? Uh, is the, it are these webworms going to hurt enough for me to, 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 to try to go out there and do something about them? Probably not. But if you can physically pull out or prune nests that are within reach and easily destroy those larvae, that's always a decent option for you. You can treat them with insecticides while they're small before those tents get big enough to repel the sprays. Again, things like uh, uh, the BT products, this particular strain, BT Kustarki, is one to use, spinosad, and the pyrethroids like bifenthrin, permethrin, and cyfluthrin, as well as malathion and, and carbaryl or seven, and a lot of different insecticides have efficacy against them. If you have any questions about these pests or other pests of plants in your landscape, you know, you can give us a call at the Extension Service Office at 615-898-7710, or you can email me, Mitchell Moat, uh, here at mmote1 at utk.edu, and I'll be glad to get back uh, with you and, and uh, try to give you the information that you're seeking. Well, folks, that's about all that I have for you. I hope you found this information useful, and I hope you'll tune in again next time. But until next time, this is Mitchell Moat from the University of Tennessee and Tennessee State University Extension Program saying so long.